Okay, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Natalie Petersee. I'm the Director of Distance Delivery at Healthcare Montana. We're going to explain all of that to you. But since there's so few of us in the room, we thought maybe you could tell us who you are. I'm Shane Cole. I'm a librarian at BYU-IO. Oh, cool. Tom Green from University of Montana. Hi. I'm John Lee from the Bush Library. Oh, cool. <laughs> Um, so we put this presentation together because we've been working on some certified nurse aid specialty courses through the Healthcare Montana grant and our grant requires that they are open education resources so we've been finding our way through that. Um, go ahead and introduce yourself Sue. Hi, I'm Dr. Sue Rowe and I am the consultant to uh, this uh, activity that we've been involved with um, and I'm greetings from Phoenix Arizona so I live in Arizona so this is I was just saying how nice the weather is because when I come up here it's usually snowing so I shouldn't say that too loudly right because it might decide to snow <laughs> really uh. hi there my name is Madeline Bame I am the healthcare apprenticeship specialist I work at Montana Department of Labor and Industry but I am an employee of the Healthcare Montana grant. I, before I joined the Department of Labor about 18 months ago, I was on the healthcare regulation side at Department of Public Health and Human Services. And actually, I ran the nurse aid registry as part of my duties there for about eight years. So I'm, I was the regulator. Regulator. I should say also that uh, this came at a really good time for me because I'm in the process of finishing a textbook for nurse, nursing assistants, which will be out in January. So it was a great alignment for me to not only be able to work on this, but also uh, be able to share the publishers allowing me to share some of the materials that I've been developing uh, with our project. So it's been a pretty exciting opportunity. Well, I've got this one. Oh, okay. Um, and I'm Natalie Petersee. I started on the Healthcare Montana grant almost just a little over a year ago. And I've been in online learning since 2003. And I've used LMSs that don't exist anymore. And I've created courses in the humanities um, for the University of Montana and schools all over the United States. And I was hired onto the grant to help with online learning since there are some problems conceptualizing that sometimes, um, to help with accessibility um, standards and OER standards um, since everything we make needs to be an OER and I don't know anything about nursing or regulating anything and that's why I have to work with these guys which has been really fun so we are Healthcare Montana is housed at Missoula College and we're tax grantees so um, the feds gave out rounds of grants to states to sort of help us recover from the recession. And there were a few here in Montana. The grant before us was called Rev Up. It was a $25 million trade grant. So working on things in the trades, welding, carpenting, carpentering, um, commercial truck driving, stuff like that. Our grant is focused on healthcare, And the point of the grant is to expand access to education in rural Montana, specifically healthcare education. So we've done that by working with the two-year colleges on um, distance delivery of um, practical nursing, for example, um, and we're trying to get more um, courses totally online. We're working on dental assisting um, and some stuff like that, um, pharmacy tech. We're working um, to get all that stuff available via distance delivery. So folks who live in rural Montana can stay where they are and still develop a profession. What's the best way to do that? Online learning. Um, our grant guidelines dictate that everything we make has to be licensed with the Creative Commons attribution of no derivatives. Um, and I'm sure you've all seen that little Creative Commons graphic. I'll talk about that in a little while. Um, <clears throat> and so while we've worked with the two-year colleges, we've also gotten a lot of information from um, employers. We've also got a lot of information from employers about what they need and the kind of things that they would like to see happening in the healthcare workforce across Montana. And through needs assessment at the beginning of the grant and through rapid response surveys, we have heard a lot about CNA development, and that's a certified nurse aide. Those are the folks that work under nurses, especially in long-term care across the state. And um, 
Through that, we got some data on what they want to see. Success skills and soft skills is something we've heard a ton about, and then these specialties. And I just want to say that I think the CNA specialties will be a good bridge between for a CNA wanting to continue their education um, that will not require them having to leave and go to LPN or RN school, but it will be an additional education piece that a CNA can have in their facility without leaving the community. And there's something else I was gonna say about that. A lot of CNAs are really good CNAs and that's what they wanna do. Some CNAs start out as CNAs because they want to increase their education. And so this is a really good stepping stone for them. Next one, maybe. We have to keep doing this because they're taping, <laughs> so I apologize for that. I also wanted to say that um, uh, when I was asked to participate in this project, um, you, Montana is going to be a leader uh, in terms of having CNA specialty uh, programming. There really isn't much out there other than on ground. So the idea of being able to have uh, online delivery for this kind of um, area is very exciting. And even in my own state, I just happened to m casually mention it to the community colleges, and they were already interested and want to deliver these specialty areas. So I think they'll be not only uh, very helpful in your own state, but it will be helpful nationally. And the idea is, is because it's online and distance delivery, um, it's uh, very, very exciting for not only a community college, but the facilities uh, as well, wanting to be able to offer continuing education for this particular group that, that normally don't get it. So these are the specialties that we zeroed in on. We're, we're almost done with restorative care, though we got some new ideas today. Um, we'll be doing one on dementia, one on mentorship, so how CNAs can mentor each other um, in a facility or in, the, in their careers, end of life, and then we're looking at making a fifth. We think we're gonna go with medication aid, but we've also heard a lot of interest in self-care, like how healthcare, people who provide healthcare can take care of themselves so that they have the stamina for, for their work. So how we came with these five as we are in facilities a lot, saying what do you need, what do you want your staff to really know and how to work with on an advanced level. We also did a resident census and Montana is an increasingly elderly state. So like restorative care is an issue in almost every healthcare facility in Montana and so is dementia. So that's why we were really kind of pushing those first. So we looked at the resident census around the state. We also, you know, we got some people saying, well, we want geriatric or acute care, but we kind of wanted the biggest bang for the buck and the most, the um, specialties that had the most interest from across the state. So that's why we picked these. So here's a little bit about how and why um, we need to make these as open education resources. So um, here's our grant. Here's our little $15 million glimmering here. <laughs> Everything we make with money is, um, you know, with taxpayer money. So it belongs to us all. So that's easy to say, but how do you do it? How do you make it so that it's a product that's actually valuable to everyone? So what we do is we include a Creative Commons license on every product we make, even an email. Um, it's all public property, anyone can look into it. And that just shows that um, we want people to give us credit for our products and we want to make sure there are no derivatives. It's kind of like it's free, but it's a little more compl complicated than being free. So we call it a no cost curriculum because it isn't really free. We can provide a facility or a community college with the restorative aid program that we make, but they still have to hire an instructor, or if a facility, they have to put in the time of a, the facility um, to have a mentor and have the mentee use work time to complete. So it's, it's a no-cost curriculum rather than being totally free. And at the same time, our task has really been how to develop these as really high quality open education resources. So everything that we create as TAC grantees will end up on this website called Skills Commons. And it contains products from every TAC grantee. So anyone who's had federal funds to work on projects like ours uploads their products. 
but I don't know if you've had a lot of experience with combing for OERs, but it's not that cool. So you go to Skills Commons and you're like, I want to see an A course in specialty course in dementia. And then you're like, oh my God, what is this? It's a jungle of nothing. And you just comb through and you look for bits and pieces and you find some ideas, but there's never really this perfect package there. So when I got on the grant and sort of educated myself about that, all this, I was like, when this is over, we are gonna have a high quality reusable package and no one will have to put themselves through this trying to comb it together. So when we got Sue on board, we talked about from the beginning, how do we make this easily reusable, something that doesn't need to be significantly revised, and something that you can open and um, just snap away at. And we also wanted to think about, and, um, and maybe you guys can help us, how we can make it available not just on Skills Commons, but how else we can get it out there, because how likely is a nursing director and San Angelo, Texas, where I was born, gonna get on Skills Commons and comb through looking for something, right? She might not know anything about it if she hasn't been part of a TACT grant. So those are all things we wanted to think about. So one of the uh, goals, as uh, Natalie just mentioned, was how we went about creating uh, these as rich interactive instructional documents because if, um, as you think about it, uh, here's this person's going to sit down and they're going to uh, be instructed through online delivery. And they may, one, never have had that experience before, and two, may not have a whole lot of time to want to invest. So we wanted to make it very interactive and um, also to create it as a complete package. Uh, one of the things that often happens is, is you get uh, some instructional curriculum and you have to piece it all together. And so what we're designing is one whole package uh, so that a facility or a community college will not only get the curriculum, uh, it's completely developed, it has all of the forms and needed resources, but also an instructor guide so that everything is there and available. And working on a grant, one of the things that happens is that they end. And the people that we're working with folks are no longer there and we wanna have sustainability. And one way to do that is just to completely package it. The other is, is we tried to make it student user friendly so that the, the student really wants to interact with it. So we kind of made it um, interesting where there's lots of discussion questions, uh, there's videos, uh, there's things that they have to do with the content. So it's not just a reading curriculum. It's a reading then learning curriculum. Uh, I talked about the instructor's guide. Uh, we will be developing some videos. One in particular is an implementation video so that as you start the instruction, there's a implementation video that talks to you about what they're going to encounter uh, and what's expected. Um, also, resources for students are in there, so all of the terminology, all the acronyms, links. So any, anything that's talked about, they can click on it and link right to the source. Um, so obviously you're already seeing that we need to make sure that uh, folks are, have some computer literacy. And so there is an opportunity for them to uh, interact. I found a really neat assessment on computer literacy that will provide for them uh, some background information. We can't assume that everybody knows how to use a computer, uh, particularly with CNAs. We may have CNAs who are um, a little bit older, who've not had an opportunity to work. So then one of the things that we needed to be aware of was to ensure that they would be able to not be frustrated when they started to do the instruction. And then as I said, all the forms that are needed are there. We've designed grading rubrics for the instructor, skills assessment checklists, um, any, any activity has blank answer sheets uh, that they'll be able to fill out and uh, so that we have the opportunity for it to be self-contained. Um, and I think that's really important. One of the things that happens with this kind of instruction that's been my experience is any sort of frustration and it gets put aside. Oh no, this is too difficult. This, I don't have everything I need. Uh, and we don't want that to happen. We really want people to be excited about it and to really want to participate. And then once they do, they'll go, oh, you know that great restorative care module? You should try that. And we want that kind of conversation happening as they're going through the instructional opportunity. 
One thing I just wanted to say is you, you might be th saying like, well, why would they, you need to make a separate grade book? Wouldn't that be in an LMS? Well, we live in Montana. There's just not, <laughs> facilities don't have learning management systems. They might not even have a free desktop for folks to, a workstation for folks to sit down and work. Um, some of the two-year colleges have expressed interest in putting this on an LMS, and so have some of the corporations, like Goodman Group is a corporation in Montana that runs long-term care. They want to put it on their ML LMS. Arizona might put it on their LMS. But otherwise, it's like, where's the LMS? Like, that's the big question. And so since we don't have an answer for that, we've got to make everything so that it can be used in a variety of ways. <clears throat> so, and that leads me to the next slide. So multiple modes of delivery. So in some places in rural Montana, there's not high-speed internet. There's like dial-up or not, or go to McDonald's and get a Wi-Fi signal. So we thought about a uh, CNA all the way out there. Maybe we print the whole thing out and put it in a notebook and let the person work um, old school at a desk with pen and paper. I don't even know if I can handwrite anymore. Every time I try, it looks terrible. Um, or on the ground, so a facility can print everything out and have a little class in a facility. Um, electronics, so if they do have a place to work, they can sit and complete it in, in a Word document or a writable PDF document, or in some cases it can be adapted, really easily adapted to be on a, an LMS, which is ideal, but not always possible. So that, so that was sort of the task that was given to me as the instructional designer. How do you then create instruction that can be utilized for all of these different formats? And we actually came up with something that I think is going to be very workable. So as an example, what I wanted to share with you. So online, you know, many of the LMS systems have discussion boards. So what I wrote was something called insight and awareness. So they'll have an activity, and then there'll be a series of discussion questions called insight and awareness. So if it's going to be on ground or pen and paper, they can just simply answer that. But if it's a discussion board, they simply turn the insight and awareness into a discussion board. So I had to come up with all different innovative ways to say, OK, so this may be now on ground. What is it going to look like? It's going to be on paper. What will it look like? But if somebody has to come in and now turn it into an LMS and use an LMS, excuse me, for instruction, there are points in the curriculum that they'll be able to easily make that conversion. Uh, so that made it really kind of interesting. And I have to say it made it a lot more interesting curriculum as a result, because I had to think of all the different ways in which it would be delivered. And I think it made it, uh, I think it actually made it more interesting for the student, uh, because they can get discussion, but it may only be in their head. They may have discussion with the instructor, or they may have discussion uh, through a discussion board, as an example. As part of this uh, TACT grant that we got from the U.S. Department of Labor, the Montana Department of Labor was tasked with developing apprenticeships in healthcare. Um, there are five components of a registered apprenticeship program. You need to have an active, engaged employer. You need to have on-the-job training. You need to have other relating, related instruction, which this is. You need to have a reward for skills gained, so as the apprentice increases their skill level, their paycheck shows that. And afterwards, there has to be some nationally recognized credential. And that last one is really important with these CNA specialties, because right now, apprenticeship is the only way to get credentialed for this work that the CNA has done. We're talking with the nurse aid registry that they'd actually get a notch on their certificate once completing this curriculum, but that is a change of statute and rules, and who knows how long that would take. The curriculum can be used with or without apprenticeship, but we do want to use apprenticeship just because they can get that credential. Um, we were talking a little bit about the ongoing processes after the grant is over, and the Montana Department of Labor is really committed to the healthcare apprenticeship piece. So that is definitely going to continue after the grant is over, and the curriculum can be housed at the Department of Labor for our apprentices. And I think that's all I needed to say about this slide. 
So, you know, we want something that's easily accessible, that lives on skillscommon.org. You search for it, you find it, you download it, you use it. Um, we want a valuable, no-cost curriculum. Um, that's really important, although we can't provide every aspect of implementing a program like this. And overall, we want it to be easy, easy, easy to reuse. So, we, we hoped maybe attendees at this conference could help us think about OER, this project as OER, and what else we can do that we haven't done to make it accessible and reusable. Or does anyone know of a project like this? Or has anyone worked on a project like this? I have a yeah. As you were developing the item for the Creative Commons mm -hmm. so are you having to find permission for already created material? Are you putting already, already created materials in? Or are you using open resources as well? Yes, to build I am. This? Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, here. Let me give you your mic. <laughs> uh, fortunately for healthcare, uh, there's a lot of government resources. So, of course, you know, that's basically the, the originator of open education resource. Um, there are some materials that are available to us for that. Uh, one of the things that we were struggling with, we actually, I think you were in the same little restaurant we were in <laughs> uh, this morning, um, is the use of YouTube, which is really a challenge. Uh, when you're doing instruction, because um, if you want sustainability, links break. And even though it looks fabulous, and you go, oh, this is like the perfect little snippet of a video, um, it, just, it just may not be there next year. And again, from a sustainability standpoint, for any curriculum, whether it's grant or not, you really need to be aware of that. So we're looking to, because we have the grant funding now, to do some create creativity in our own videoing. So because this is very skills-laden, uh, often when you're in healthcare, uh, we're going to do some videoing and then creating our own videos for uh, these modules that we're creating. Um, but yeah, we actually have to use anything that's not copyrightable. Is that, wait, so that's any a terrible images word. we include, we make yeah. sure they have a Creative Commons, Commons. license? Right, yeah. Um, and again, because it's a, it's a grant funded, but even if you were doing it without a grant, um, you still have that issue. Um, fortunately, there's more and more of those materials out there, thank goodness. Um, but it is a dilemma. Um, and Sue's writing a lot of it from scratch. So, you know, students would never need a te textbook for this because... Yeah. yeah, there is no textbook. a lot it of is. original material that Sue came up with. So it's a, it's a true online delivery. So if it's offered on ground, what will be nice is the instructor will have all the content. Uh, so the students will read and they'll be able to do kind of like a, a flipped classroom. So the students will be able to read and then they'll be able to do mostly activities in the classroom. So I think there'll be a lot of opportunity. Did I, did I over answer no. your question? <laughs> 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 You're welcome. Um, yeah, we, we actually created a format, is what I'm calling it, or a template. Okay. Because, uh, because what we said was we weren't sure at the very beginning that there would even be an LMS available. So we had to create some standard template. So I created a standard template that we'll use for every module. In fact, it's working really so well that some of the other projects that we're doing on the grant, we're thinking about using the same kind of a, a format or template. And what's nice about it is, is I create it from all of my experience doing online instructional development. So I was already in the back of my head knew that even though it might have all of these different formats and deliveries, um, it would be easily transformed into an online delivery, which was our hope. Our hope was, and obviously what's happened is, is that there's been some, a lot of interest in being able to do that. files and um, angel files and all these other files to improve. 
support the course. So if there is a learning management system present, uh, just include that as a zip that they can just. Right, and that's that's not hard to do. And yeah. Google's open source too, right. so you can create materials on there, and it doesn't it doesn't matter. It belongs to you. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's an idea. You can also there's a LTI. I don't know if you've heard of LTI, but you can and it'll work in Moodle or Blackboard. It's, it's a interop learning tools interoperability standard, and so it will. And we do this at, at Carol with some courses. A, a publishing company or a teacher that comes from there, elsewhere will have one of these LTIs, and it'll just pop right in, and it'll be like a frame within Moodle, and it works that way too. So that's, that's one of the cool. Things to look at. I mean, one of the sad things is we haven't had a lot of interest from any academic institutions. And they're the ones that would host Moodle or any kind of learning management system. And so, you know, and then if they're willing to do it but not willing to enroll students, you know? So it's this it's interesting roadblock between, because it's kind of non-academic material. So. I can make a yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we can do that too. But yeah. I think that the other is, is that we didn't want to make it so challenging to even capture because facilities are interested and we weren't we didn't know how sophisticated or comfortable they were with anything that looked electronic <laughs> I, I mean it's just our reality so that was why we also wanted to create this continuum where they would have this flexibility but absolutely I mean we're we're still in a place where we um, we have the adaptability if you will to create it in any way that's going to that will work. The goal is to get the instruction out there. Yeah. Thank you for that. We'll look into that. Any other questions or comments or that can help us? I'm looking for actually your personal experience in developing the OER from a book perspective. Every time you see a two hundred dollar textbook trying to find a source of alternative sources, a lot of the time they're switching costs. And then all the time trying to figure that out the content. Mm -hmm. um, I'll say, you know, one of the states I've looked to a lot with my project is Washington State. They seem to be like maybe 20 years <laughs> in some ways. But um, th with their TAC grant, they really pushed OER. And they have a website called Open Washington, Open WA. And they really talked about how they use their grant money to get away from textbooks in the two-year college system um, and what they went about doing to do that. Um, and they've had, I think they've had a lot of success with it. Um, they're also really committed to learning technology and online learning, and they have a two-year college association so that the two-year colleges are always talking and working on online learning. And we don't, we have, you know, the big, conglomeration of things that we have. So that complicates it a little bit. But then I've also been like, have you heard of OpenStax? Yeah. Have you used any of that or? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, it seems like it would be cool to just pay one developer and then release it. You know, I know that um, the sciences have to be updated all the time. And um, I wonder if, you know, people can just have their own workaround. Like at the University of Montana, I hired one content developer and then made it free. It would be so much cheaper for students, you know. But. I think the other thing that happens, having been a faculty member myself, is um, that you always want to put your own stamp on it. Uh, and even though that you might use a textbook, uh, one of the things that we're trying to do with these is to make them very self-contained. Uh, but also with the ability that the faculty member wouldn't need, for instance, a textbook, they would just need to add additional materials. So it is very self-contained. Um, and the way in which I format it is it's, it's a series of questions based upon the objectives and the learning outcomes. So, so it sort of brings the, the student in, and then it provides all of the narrative and all of the resources. So it would be very easy then to have everything you need, and then if the faculty member wanted to add anything more, they could just add it right into that section. Um, and there's no need then for a textbook. 
I shouldn't say that. I'm, I'm publishing a textbook, right? <laughs> you're, scares working, me. you're working yourself what out of business here. here? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I hadn't thought about it. <laughs> but yeah, so, so that was one way. But, but I can understand the faculty often have real trouble letting go of that textbook uh, because they're looking, they're not looking to have to write everything they want to say. So they figure if I have a textbook, then this, so that's what I'm trying to do is to, to put everything into the instructional content so that it's all there, uh, which is why it's taking a long time because I want to be sure that we're, we're running the full loop for what they need to know. Well, thank you guys for coming. Thank you. I hope it was helpful. Yay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> if you've got any ideas, reach out to us. We're at Missoula College.